You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to The Corbett Report. I am your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here on the 11th day of March, 2022. Welcome to episode 415 of the Corporate Report podcast, The Global Digital ID Prison. Say, do you ever get the idea that seemingly every government, corporation, financial institution, and globalist connected NGO in the entire world is right now pushing the idea of digital ID as the way of the future? Well, you're right, they are. My name is Dave Treat. I lead Accenture's blockchain business. Uh, it's a, actually blockchain and multi-party systems business. Uh, and part of uh, part of our focus and part of the business that we've been building, uh, you know, re- really has had at the had at its core the transformation of of you know large scale ecosystems. And at the heart of it, there've really been two key gaps that we've been focused on now for a few years and making significant investments in. One of which you may have seen, we've had a focus throughout the the past uh, week around uh, work that we're doing around uh, central bank digital currency. The other one, and the focus of tonight, uh, is really the other, which is digital identity. Hello everyone, meet Lucy, student in psychology. And me, her digital ID wallet issued by the government to offer a wide range of identity services. In fact, I'm a handy way of proving and protecting her identity both online and face to face. Let's have a closer look at what I can do. I can help governments to better communicate with citizens. Right now, I'm reminding Lucy of the appointment she needs to schedule for her mandatory vaccination. Canada's banks are perfectly situated to help lead the creation of a federated digital ID system between government and the private sector. The World Economic Forum agrees that banks and financial institutions should lead the path forward for digital ID. Banks are highly regulated and trusted. They have advanced cybersecurity and privacy technology, and they have the infrastructure to operate provincially and nationally. Und aus diesem Grund wird die Kommission demnächst eine sichere europäische digitale Identität vorschlagen. With Digital ID, Australia Post offers a secure and convenient way to prove your identity. Verify your way and save time with Digital ID. Free to download from the App Store and Google Play Store. Now I know what you're thinking, you silly conspiracy theorist. You might be thinking, hey, take a look at these governments and corporations and financial institutions and NGOs that have presided over the self-evident debacle of the past couple of years, the drive towards COVID-1984 biosecurity tyranny of quarantines and lockdowns and uh, vaccine mandates and vaccine passports, And see how now, suddenly, we're being corralled into this global digital ID system. And you might stop and think to yourself, you know, I'm not so sure this is all about my health and well-being. But you're just being overly cynical. No, no, no. You see, just as the transhuman brain chips that are coming are all about helping crippled people type, the global digital ID grid is being crafted in order to help children go to school and help people access medical services, especially those yummy, nutritious mRNA vaccines, and, I don't know, providing double rainbows with pots of gold on each end. And it, that's all it's about. I mean, we can take it from people like, oh, I don't know, Dakota Gruner, the executive director of ID2020. Now, the ability to prove who you are with certainty and in a manner that's recognized and trusted by institutions and by governments is a fundamental prerequisite to accessing even the most basic services. If you can't prove who you are, you have limited access to healthcare, to education, to other social programs. Your ability to move across borders, to vote, to enroll in school, uh, to access a bank account is limited or non-existent. What's more, women and children are at a greater risk of being victims of human trafficking. So whatever is your most urgent concern, Refugees, economic inequality, human trafficking, financial inclusion, universal health care, global education, I could go on. Whatever it is, you care about identity. 
Indeed, the UN estimates that 17, 10 of the 17 sustainable development goals cannot be met without first closing the identity gap. Even more fundamentally, identity is a human right. Article 6 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights reads, everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Let me stress that, everyone, everywhere. There is dignity, there is opportunity in being able to prove your identity. That is Dakota Gruner, the executive director of ID2020, presenting at the TEDx Marrakesh conference back in July of 2019. And not only will I provide the link to that video in the show notes for today's episode at corbettreport.com slash digital ID, along with everything else that I cite today, but I will wholeheartedly encourage you to go and watch that full 13-minute presentation so that you get the full context of that, of that talk, in which Dakota Gruner is talking not just about the benefits of digital ID, but also its potential risks. Specifically, her talk is entitled Digital Identity Weighing the Risks of Misuse and Missed Use. So later on in that presentation, she raises the specter of missed use of digital ID, which is to say once we create a digital ID panopticon system that is tracking and tracing everything that everyone does at all times, if you don't have a digital ID, then you'll really be out of luck and you won't be able to access any any government services, any corporations, you won't be able to travel, you won't be able to do anything. So in order to combat the problem of missed use, we have to make sure that no one is left behind. Where have we heard that before? And that everyone gets herded into the digital ID cattle pen. She also, to her credit, does raise the specter of misuse of digital ID systems and does note that, oh yeah, by the way, uh, it turns out identification schemes can be used for, say, cataloging people in order to genocide them. But, you know, anyway, we need to, we need to solve these problems before we implement the digital ID. But you better believe which side of the ledger Dakota Gruner falls on is the we need to implement digital ID. It, there are risks, but we need to do it. That's why we need this global conversation, by which she means talks between governments and corporations and NGOs about the best way to set up, set up the architecture for this ID. And who should be at the head of this conversation? Well, of course, ID 2020 should be. What is ID 2020? Well, you can go to the id2020.org homepage of the ID 2020 Alliance to find out more, um, where if you go to their homepage, you'll see they start by telling you that we need to get digital ID right. And they will explain more about that in their talk here. So, so since 2016, ID 2020 has advocated for ethical privacy protecting approaches to digital ID. And then it goes on to give a lot of the same spiel that uh, Gruner was just giving there. But if you go to the About page, you can see that they have a manifesto. So let's click on over to that and pick up on what sorts of things they're telling us in this manifesto. For example, the Alliance Manifesto, number one, the ability to prove one's identity is a fundamental and universal human right. Now, I want to pick up on that phrase, which you will see parroted everywhere by all of the people who are pushing for this digital ID agenda. They always point to this idea that the ability to prove your identity is a human right. And when they lead you down that garden path, it, it makes a certain logic. There is a certain logic to it. It makes uh, sense, at least when they put it in a certain framework. Well, you have to have the ability to prove who you are so that then you can access the government services and other things that are predicated on that identity. There is a sense to it, but as I will get into more later, that is actually probably where the fundamental deception begins. Uh, number two, we live in a digital era. Individuals need a trusted, verifiable way to prove who they are, both in the physical world and online. Mm -hmm. Number three, over 1 billion people worldwide are unable to prove their identity through any recognized means. As such, they are without the protection of law and are unable to access basic services, participate as a citizen or voter, or transact in the modern economy. Most of those affected are children and adolescents, and many are refugees, forcibly displaced, or stateless persons. Won't somebody think of the children? Won't somebody think of the poor? Uh, I, this is, I think, the key thrust of the way that Gruner started that presentation and introduced the subject to people. Yes, it's very easy for you, rich, privileged, white person living in the Western developed world with your 
driver's license and passport and what have you, but think of how hard it is for the poor people who don't have access to those types of documents. And number four, for some, including refugees, the stateless, and other marginalized groups, reliance on national identification systems isn't possible. So maybe due to exclusion, inaccess inaccessibility, or risk, or because the credentials they hold uh, are not broadly recognized. All right, uh, we believe that individuals must control have control over their own digital identities, including how personal data is collected, used, and shared? Sure, yeah, privacy, portability, persistence. Hmm, an interesting alliteration that they introduced to the mix there. A uh, digital identity carries significant risk if not thoughtfully designed and carefully implemented, which again, is very much in line with Gruner's presentation. Technical design can mitigate some of the risks of digital identity. So emerging technology, for example, cryptographically secure decentralized systems could provide greater privacy protection for users while also allowing for portability and verifiability. But widespread agreements on principles, technical design patterns, and interoperability standards is needed for decentralized digital identities to be trusted and recognized. This better model of digital identity will not emerge spontaneously. Spontaneous order? Pff, what's that? No, if we didn't have the world government telling people the what how to speak English and what English is and defining words in a in law, <laughs> there would not be an English language. How could that have ever arisen except by a government coming in and telling people how to speak? <laughs> Anyway, uh, how could computers exist if there wasn't a government telling corporations how to make computers? Because computers are operating systems on hardware devices that have different software. How could all of these companies coordinate together if there wasn't a governmental structure telling them how to design it all? It's just, it's unimaginable, guys. <laughs> Number nine, ID2020 Alliance partners jointly define functional requirements, including the course of technical innovation and providing a route to technical interoperability and therefore trust and recognition. And number 10, the ID2020 Alliance recognizes that taking these ideas to scale requires a robust evidence base, which will inform advocacy and policy. Blah, blah, blah. All right. So a lot of meaningless corporate buzz speak blather. Some interesting points that are, I think, profoundly philosophically flawed, but... I'm, they're hoping you won't notice that. But this raises the question, wait, ID 2020? Who is this? What is this? What is this alliance? What are they talking about? So if you go to their main about page, they will say quite simply, the ID 2020 alliance is setting the course of digital ID. ID 2020 is coordinating funding for identity and channeling these funds towards high impact projects, enabling diverse stakeholders, UN agencies, NGOs, governments, and enterprises to pursue a coordinated approach coordinated approach that requires, that creates a pathway for efficiency and responsible implementation at scale. All right. And then, okay, well, whatever, blah, 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 it's principles, da, 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 da. Oh, who, who comprises this alliance? Who are the alliance partners? Alliance partners include, and here is a list of, I guess, what they take to be the highlights of the ID2020 alliance. And some of these, I think, will be well familiar to my audience by now. Everyone knows Microsoft, and everyone in the conspiracy realist world knows about the Rockefeller Foundation and its infamy, uh, infamous history. Um, there are other organizations in here that you may not have heard of, but probably should. I mean, for example, how about Simprints? Every person counts. What is that? Well, if you go to simprints.com, you can find out that our biometric solution will help you track, tra tackle your greatest impact challenges. So helping the poor people of the world get scanned into their smartphones and taking the digital ID photographs and fingerprints and, oh, it'll be so great. Tools and services for holistic support. Oh, you gotta love how they frame these types of things. So they they provide mobile software, biometric ID, project configuration, project management, training materials, data analytics, and privacy and data security provided by your thumbprint or your iris scan or whatever you're looking for. What a wonderful organization. So. I would put this forward as a research project for the budding young researchers in the crowd. I think every single one of these organizations and its connection to the ID2020 Alliance and what it gets out of it and what it puts into it is probably an entire, well, podcast-worthy thing in and of itself. So if there are any researchers in the crowd who are interested, I would suggest tackling some of these bodies and groups. But one in particular that we can highlight right away that hopefully will be familiar to the Corbett Report audience is Gavi the 
Bill and Melinda Gates co-founded Vaccine Alliance, which is seeking to create healthy markets for big pharma manufacturers to manufacture and distribute vaccines around the world. Hmm, Gavi the Vaccine Alliance. Now, how did they connect into the digital ID agenda? In order to understand the broader population control agenda and how it ties into the Gates Foundation's plans, we have to look at a puzzling development that took place in 2017. In that year, Gavi, the Gates-founded and funded alliance that partners the Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, and the World Bank with vaccine manufacturers to help ensure healthy markets for vaccines, took a strange pivot away from its core mission of vaccinating every child on the planet to providing every child with a digital biometric identity. The idea was first floated by Gavi CEO Seth Berkeley in a Nature article that year, Immunization Needs a Technology Boost, where he states that the goal of 100% immunization will not be reached without secure digital identification systems that can store a child's medical history. He then gives a specific example. We are working with a company in India called Kushi Baby, which creates off-grid digital health records. A necklace worn by infants contains a unique identification number on a short-range communication chip. Community health workers can scan the chip using a mobile phone, enabling them to update a child's digital record even in remote areas with little phone coverage. This sudden interest in digital identity was no mere passing fancy for the Vaccine Alliance. Gavi doubled down by becoming a founding member of the ID2020 Alliance, a public-private partnership dedicated to spearheading a global digital biometric identity standard. Other founding members of the Alliance include Gates' first company, Microsoft, and the Rockefeller Foundation. In 2018, Gavi issued a call for innovation in digital technologies for finding, identifying, and registering the most vulnerable children. The call specifically requested technologies for capturing, storing, and enrolling the biometric details of infants on rugged biometric devices. Berkeley continued to follow up on this idea in public engagements as one of the new core missions of Gavi. What's interesting is that people tend to think of, you know, birth certificates as kind of a major document. But, you know, the most common, as, as I mentioned before, is not a birth certificate, is not a death certificate, is not a marriage certificate. The most common connection, vital registration for the population is actually a child health card because we reach more than 90 percent of children with at least one dose of vaccine as part of routine. So they're in the system. The challenge is that contact is not connected into the system. So if you could connect it, then you have the ability to give them their basic identity papers. You have ability then later on if they want to own land or they want to have their rights, you're able to help them with that. But, you know, we're not currently taking advantage of that. And so the children get seen, they get enrolled in the health centers, but that information is not used for anything else. Ah, yes. Now you're starting to see how this starts to connect in to the greater agenda that is being pushed right now. And yes, if you have not watched or rewatched Who is Bill Gates recently, I suggest you go back and do so, at least, at the very least, for the purposes of today's conversation, part three on Bill Gates and the population control grid, where I lay out piece by piece, step by step, how the digital ID ties into the vaccination push and how the vaccination push and the digital ID become a vaccine passport, which can then be tied into broader national identification systems like the Bill Gates-backed Indian Adhar biometric ID system, which can then be nexused into the digital currency push that we are seeing right now. And every single thread of this great reset tapestry that is being woven right now by the Gateses and the Schwabs and all of the other would-be superclass uh, uh, globalists are connected through this nexus point of digital ID. This is the linchpin of the coming great reset transhumanist, fourth industrial revolution, merging of biological, digital, physical identities, new world order, whatever they're calling it this week, that is being constructed right now. And of course, as you saw in the Who is Bill Gates documentary, that of course that ends up with none other than Bill Gates himself telling us what a wonderful thing it is to go in and create broad national identification systems. 
Every country really needs to look through these uh, KYC Know Your Customer rules uh, to make sure that uh, customers are able to prove who they are. But, of course, in many countries, you don't have any type of ID system. And the lack of an ID system is a problem, not just for the payment system, but also for voting and health and education and taxation. And so it's a wonderful thing to go in and create a broad identification system. Again, India is a very uh, interesting example of this, where the Aadhaar system, which is a 12-digit identifier that's correlated to biometric measures, uh, is becoming pervasive throughout the country and will be the foundation uh, for how we bring this uh, low-cost switch to every mobile phone user in India. Uh, the same type of thing is happening now in, in Pakistan, uh, and there's early beginnings of creating these ID programs in Africa as well. Uh, we expect to be able to use the ID so that when you show up for any government service, say you, you walk into a primary health clinic, uh, we'll be able to take that bio-ID very quickly and bring up your electronic health record. Even if you've moved from one part of the country to the other, you will be well-tracked and well-served uh, without nearly as much paperwork or, paperwork or uh, waiting. And so the ID system is foundational. Ah, yes, what could possibly go wrong with having our digital identities tied into national and, of course, eventually global digital ID grids that will then also be tied into our digital currencies and payments and proving ourselves to the banks and what have you. What Again, what could possibly go wrong? Yes, if you are a Corbett Report member or even just a casual viewer of this type of material, it probably doesn't need to be spelled out for you why this is such an important part of the coming nightmare totalitarian panopticon system that is being erected in the digital world for our digital identities in the near future. But let's go through that. Let's set some of the table here so that we understand the enormity of the behemoth which we are confronting that is not being forwarded by any one particular government or corporation or financial institution or NGO, but all of them working together in concert have been working on this for years now behind the scenes and most people have no idea. Oh yeah, there's some sort of new ID that's rolling out, whatever. I'll just go and get mine and then I'll use it wherever it's asked for in whatever way. Why do we have to think about this? Well, let's take a look at the people who are spending time, money, energy, resources talking and thinking deeply about this question of identity and why they are thinking about it. So, as with everything else in the modern 20 world of 2022, you can probably start by at least finding some helpful spokes off of the hub of this agenda from our good friends at the World Economic Forum. And this topic does not disappoint in that regard. So, if you go to the World Economic Forum, you will find a number of things that the WEF has been involved in in recent years around this topic. For example, going back to March of 2020, in a report that was presumably written and compiled before the COVID scandemic became a thing, they had this, talking about known traveler digital identity specifications guidance. It's a white paper that is talking about a trusted, decentralized, and interoperable identity platform enabled through technologies, including blockchain, biometrics, mobile devices, and cryptography. Blockchain? Is this that Bitcoin thing? Ah, what's a PSYOP? The forum and its partners are currently piloting components of the KTDI concept in, real, in a real-life cross-border context to further enhance the concept and inform future pilots. And the pilot learnings will also help inform the development of best practices and standards. So this is a white paper that you can read through if you're interested, setting out some of the standards, open specifications, and industry best practices that have shaped the initial pilot, and then a discussion of that. But yes, in case you didn't know, this known traveler uh, digital identity uh, concept is a thing, and it is a set of specifications and guidelines that I believe is now actually being employed um, by the TSA and others as part of their pre-check clearances for passengers and what have you. Uh, it gets introduced gradually and in 
points of where people are generally susceptible to whatever rules are being put in place this week, like in international travel, and then it starts to be rolled out for the population generally. And how is that done? Well, we can fast forward a little bit later in 2020, specifically to November of 2020, when the scandemic was in full swing, where we saw that the World Economic Forum was informing us a billion people have no legal identity but a new app plans to change that. And so the uh, the bullet point summary here, a billion people in the world have no legal identity. Where have you heard that before? In fact, you will hear that in every one of these presentations by every one of these globalist insiders who are connected to this agenda. Oh, won't someone think of the poor starving refugees? And the only way to do it is with digital ID. Without an ID, they can't open a bank, get a loan, or even vote. Oh, no. They can't put their suggestion in the slave suggestion box. Oh, no. Now a tech entrepreneur has come up with an answer. Joseph Thompson's digital app allows people to prove and protect their identity. His company, ATEC, has also found a way to pr protect charity funds from corruption. So you can read, again, a, a summary of the, the problem as they see it and the solution that they're offering, including this new idea, including this infographic, which the World Economic Forum puts on all of their digital identity pages, talking about the entities, devices, and people and things that require digital identities for different parts of our increasingly digital uh, world and experience. And then they go on to talk about the first blockchain baby. So, uh, talking about this founder of this new app, that's when Thompson's thoughts turned to help solve the problems of people with no legal ID. One of the issues they face is registering the birth of a child. Women without legal ID face particular obstacles where laws require the father's ID to be used when a birth is registered. We've got projects in Tanzania where we had the first baby in the world born on the blockchain, says Thompson. The mother who gave birth, she owned the data for the child. So she was building a data credit profile. She could pr prove she got the right medicine. A data credit profile. What an interesting choice of words. And I, I imagine when they're really ready to start rolling this out in a concerted, full-on propaganda push, they will not be using such phrases as data credit profiles, because of course that brings to mind what is obviously going to be an important part of this grid going into the future. The social credit system, which absolutely already exists to some extent, but is going to be hardwired into the digital identity matrix in the near future. So you're, yeah, you're building a data credit profile. You're also building essentially a social credit profile. And how could that possibly go wrong? Uh-oh, you donated to some truckers that were starting an insurrection in the capital. Looks like your access to financial services are going to be flicked off with this handy dandy switch that we now have for you, citizen. And the funny thing is that just a month ago, there would have been people out there who would have dismissed that as pure conspiracy lunacy. Oh, you think governments would do that? And now that the Canadian government has shown that they will do exactly that under any pretense for any declared emergency in any supposed national insurrection against bouncy castles and honking horns, now it's perfect, it's a good thing, and yes, we do need this to protect our democracy. <laughs> so the very, keep this in mind, this is of course, as something I'm sure you will have noticed by now, but the very people who most flippantly dismiss your concerns as crazy conspiracy theorizing will be the very people who will most vociferously defend those very things when they come into reality. It's a very interesting psychological phenomenon. So anyway, this is uh, some of what the WEF has to say. There's also this, how digital identity can improve lives in a post-COVID-19 world from January of 2021. And then uh, I, I thought it was particularly interesting here, the pull quote on, as proven in Canada. <laughs> so again, January 2021 context, not February or March of 2022. As proven in Canada, a digital ID ecosystem is not only a motor to connect people, governments, and the private sector in a trusted and transparent way, but it also accelerates participation in the economy, work, and mobility. As long as you're a good citizen, <laughs> right? Oh, you donate to the wrong to, uh, protest movement? Uh-oh, no, we're going to turn that off for you. Again, you can't, you, you can hardly... Imagine how quickly the uh, narrative agenda is changing right now so that it's 
it's I almost feel sympathy for the normies who have to do the mental gymnastics to keep up with the latest. Uh, that's a conspiracy theory. No, actually, it just happened. I mean, it's a good thing. <laughs> you can see them doing the uh, the bullet time matrix sort of thing to try to dodge the bullets of of reason and logic. Oh no, they're going to make me actually be consistent. Ah. It's it's uh, it would be funny, I suppose, if this if we weren't talking about the future of humanity, which is hanging in a balance right now. And another window into that also from the World Economic Forum. I'll mention it for the second time in two weeks. You'll remember that last week on the Corbett Report podcast, we we're talking about the future of censorship. And in that context, I, I pointed you towards the Advancing Digital Agency report from the World Economic Forum on the power of data intermediaries, talking about how in the future, we're going to have data intermediaries operating on our devices. So these data intermediaries will be handling all of our information and passing it off here and there as needed as we go around through our everyday activities, which are increasingly about connections between devices, essentially. So it could be something as straightforward as going to the store and purchasing something. Well, you just wave it through the scanner and you're gone and your da device talks to the store's device and it gets approval and it makes a little beep sound or whatever and you get out and that's it. Hey, it'll be so convenient. But it's much, 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 much broader than that because remember, we are on the cusp of the 5G connected internet of everything, where everything that we have, everything that we own, everything that we wear, everywhere we're going, will have its own embedded RFID chips connected into the uh, 5G grid, which will be communicating constantly with our slave tracking device that we keep in our pocket. So that, I mean, just as one example, you go to a place with public Wi-Fi and you don't have to go and sit there and connect and enter in the public Wi-Fi password. No, your device is already doing this. It's saying, hey, this is this is James Corbett, and this is his GPS location, this is his phone ID number, and this is his address, and this is whatever else you need. And then the Wi-Fi router sends that to your data intermediary, all the information that you need to log in, and then it logs in for you. And of course, all of this is happening seamlessly and instantaneously so that you just take your phone out of your pocket and you've got Wi-Fi and you start doing what you do, right? And imagine that literally everywhere you go, everything you're doing, uh, when you get in your car to drive, you're talking, to, your device is talking to your car, it's talking to the streetlights and whatever else is around you. That is the, the data intermediary future. And of course, that nexus is directly into the question of digital ID and how do you prove or your, how does your device prove who you are and what standards should be in place. So of course, one of the key sections of this report is moving towards trusted digital agency, as in the role of digital identity in supporting human agency, because that's what it's about, it's human-centric. So if you skip down to that section of the report, you can find uh, the way that the World Economic Forum is framing this. So they, they start by saying, can the use of data intermediaries establish a notion of digital self-determination by helping people navigate technologies and data ecosystems models without losing sight of what it means to be human in terms of agency and expectations, our digital identities may hold the key to allowing us to determine how we can start to navigate the data ecosystem around us in a more sophisticated manner. So they start talking about digital ID, the electronic equivalent of an individual's identity card. That's all it is, guys. It's just the digital version of the thing you already have. So why would you be concerned about this? Neglecting to note, as I have in the past, and I will throw in my previous um, talk about the global ID system that's being constructed and why it's a bad thing, as I noted in the past, every step along the path towards national identification systems of any sort have always in the past been viewed as steps towards the creation of governmental tyranny, or at least the, the creation of the institutions and, uh, and, and systems that can enable that kind of tyranny, which is why driver's licenses, let alone social security numbers. Now this is clearly, this is the mark of the beast. This is, they're trying to track and control and surveil us. Fast forward to 2022, who even thinks about it? Yeah, I've got a, everyone gets a social security, whatever, who cares? It's just a number. Anyway, and they go on to say, it is a way to provide verified, personally identifying information on an individual for a software to read and process, blah, blah, blah. Good digital identity has five key components. And then they go on to list, of course, they show us this again, the, 
this infographic that they love to show us about the evolving scope of digital ID, and they talk about its evolution and into the future. And then, of course, they get to the COVID uh, passports. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to a heightened focus on the power of medical data, specifically so-called vaccine passports. These passports by nature serve as a form of digital identity. Wow. It's almost like this has all been planned out in advance and we're just living a pre-scripted set of events. Commercial entities serve as a type of centralized data intermediary in, se in several jurisdictions. Given the sensitivity of this type of health data, in many cases, governments have procured third-party contractors to administer and manage such systems. Unsurprisingly, strict security and privacy criteria are central to such systems in most cases, not least because a public policy health concern relies on increasing trust in the system. Trust in the system. It does come back to that, doesn't it? Um, and it, it goes on to talk about some of the implications and uh, possible risks of this. For example, vaccine data is an incredible public health asset. So the United Kingdom government in particular has acknowledged this and suggested that anonymization, pseudonymization, data shielding techniques could be harnessed in a controlled environment to allow for reuse of that highly sensitive data. But don't worry, guys. Anonymized, pseudonymized shielded, whatever. Don't worry, we're taking care of it. In such cases, notice and consent is not required per se for the reuse of the data. So again, they're already putting the loopholes, stipulations, and fine print in the back door of these white papers that no one in the general public is going to read anyway about the system that they're constructing and saying, look guys, we got entire organizations working on this, alliances, NGOs, corporations, some of the biggest names and, and most smart people on the, the, the most smart people <laughs> on the planet are working on it. So you don't have to, don't worry about it guys. And look, we've thought about everything and when and where and how these different things can be. Anyway, just turn on whatever the default settings are on your device and just go. That is the way it will inevitably be presented to people. And anyone who is a holdout or resists this is not just, is not just going to be breaking the laws that will eventually require us to present our digital ID in various forms and to various so-called authorities in various situations, but we will be bad people. Because you think of all the poor, starving young children and... Uh, refugees, and whoever else needs these types of systems. So let's get to that point, because I think that is the underlying philosophical point, which is the real basis for this that we have to interrogate if we're going to talk about this in a more thoroughgoing manner. So let's turn to those United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals, which we all know about, right? I don't know what it's like in whatever neck of the woods you happen to be living in, but I can tell you in Japan, the SDGs are becoming a thing. And you see these little colorful boxes all over the place, including even on advertisements for most products and services. They'll have the little boxes in the corner to let you know which SDGs this product or service or whatever they're advertising is in support of and whatever cockamamie excuse they have for trying to fit that in who knows who cares no one no one I don't think anyone really stops and considers it carefully it's just there to constantly remind you about the UN sustainable development goals and we're all working towards this guys right so I would imagine probably like 99% of people you probably heard of the sustainable development goals by now but Probably, if you're like 99% of the population. Have you read them? <laughs> ah, re uh, whatever. Detail schmetails. It's just helping the earth or something. And yeah, if you go to the sdgs.un.org slash goals site where they introduce the goals to, yeah, you can basically get that sort of uh, back of the cereal box version of this. So it just says, you know, goal number one, no poverty. Hey, sounds good. Number, number two, zero hunger. Hey, number three, good health and well-being. That sounds great. mRNA vaccines, whatever. Quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable. I like good things too. All right, go UN. <laughs> I wonder if there are any devils hiding in these details. Let's find out. So let's take a look at number 16. Peace, justice, and strong institutions. <laughs> I, I get that peace and justice are things that most people inherently, naturally, I mean, that's those are just buzzwords that are standing in for good things. Strong institutions. I don't know about you. Maybe I'm just cynical after 15 years of doing the Corbett Report, but even that phrase does not sound good to me. I imagine draconian uh, governmental tyranny when I hear the phrase strong institutions, but 
Yeah, that's just me, right? All right, well, let's click on to goal 16 and find out more about this goal and what it's purporting to do. Goal 16, promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Which, if we were <laughs> if we were going to imply the Stuart Chase model that I talked about, I believe, in episode 351, off the top of my head, at any rate, talking about language as a weapon, uh, I think we, we could call this uh, promote blab and blab societies for blab development, provide access to blab for all, and build blab accountable and inclusive blab at all levels. <laughs> Which is essentially what this is really telling us. Uh, but... Well, what does that actually mean? What are the targets and indicators for this goal? So, for example, target 16.1, significantly reduce all forms of violence and related death rates everywhere. All right. Okay. Less death. Okay. 16.2, end abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence against and torture of children. Hey, I'm not in favor of torture of children either. I guess, I guess I'm on board with this agenda. 16.3, promote the rule of law at the national and international levels and ensure equal access to justice for all. Again, I understand the way Joe Normie would read that phrase and they would generally be in support of that. I have obviously different ideas, I think, um, than a lot of people about what that means, law at the national and international levels. Hey, I've done an entire podcast on international law and what that really means. 16.4, by 2030, significantly re reduce illicit financial and arms flow. Illicit financial flow. Hmm. I wonder if what that would look like in reality. Maybe something like what just happened in Canada, right? Illicit funds to those those insurrectionist truckers, right? 16.5, substantially reduce corruption and bribery. 16, develop effective, accountable, and transparent institutions. Ensure response, blah, blah, blah. Yes, feel good, pap. Yay, wonderful. All right. Oh, but 16.9, let's look at this one. By 2030, provide legal identity for all, including birth registration. Again, to the average person reading this in a decontextualized way, that sounds wonderful. What does that really mean, though? How is the UN going to steward over a process that's going to make sure that everyone on Earth is provided legal identity? Uh, oh, well, okay. Well, one of the indicators, the only indicator listed here, proportion of children under five years of age whose births have been registered with a civil authority by age. So as long as governments around the world are making sure that their human cattle are properly tagged and identified and issued a barcode at birth, then... Hey, good. We can reach this wonderful goal. Which, let's go back to the way that uh, Dakota Gruner was putting it in that opening clip from today. It's, it's not just, this isn't just a good thing. It's a human right. It is a right to be able to prove your identity so that then you can access government services and, and functions. This isn't just, this isn't something that they are uh, providing to you that you can choose or not choose. This isn't something that they are offering no, 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 no. This is something that you should be demanding. This is a human right to prove your identity. But let's think about the implications of that. Essentially, what it is saying is that these institutions and structures and services and other things that are structured around us having to provide a document in order to prove we are who we say we are, in order to access or to travel or to do anything. Now, Let's think about this in the context of, say, let's put ourselves in the mindset of pre-industrial society, when none of this existed. National identification systems, passports, all of these things, credit cards, whatever, all of these documents and tokens and uh, this is my identity, none of that existed. How did human society function before that point? Well, yes, I suppose there was an identity system of some sort, at, at least a reputation-based system, in pre-industrial society, you were your reputation, and you gained a reputation by being part of a community, by contributing to that community, by providing services and or products or whatever it is that you did that people would know and recognize and they'd come to trust. Oh, this guy, this guy makes great shoes, whatever it is. And you gain a reputation over years of hard work. And through that reputation, you can then forward that on through building up whatever enterprise you're involved in, etc. And to a certain extent, I suppose you could say that that, that 
natural reputation-based system can be replicated or at least mimicked in the online digital world. So, of course, the example that springs to mind, although <laughs> this this is probably dated by now. Does anyone still use eBay? Anyway, you'll remember eBay back when that was a thing. Um, had How do you know what sellers to trust and what am I going to buy from this Am I going to buy from this guy or this guy? Well, this guy's, you know, 50% lower price, but this guy has 12 reviews and the average review is one star and everyone's saying it was a scam and they got ripped off and it never delivered. And this one has 4,792 reviews and it's 4.5 stars and everyone's saying it was great, arrived on time, no problem. It's a reputation-based system. Now, is there ways to scam and... You know, can you be swindled in the reputation-based system? It certainly can, and especially when we get farther and farther detached from actual physical reality and real community and more and more into the digital space. Of course. Of course there are ways and loopholes. So in order to close those loopholes and stop anyone ever being scammed again, we need to create systems that require certain digital identification that is then tied to you and to everything that you do and all of your transactions and everywhere that you go so that it can monitor and know everything about you. But don't worry, you get to choose what information is being shared, when and by whom, except in those cases where you are by law required to, prov to provide a certain piece of identification in order to access a certain service or to cross an imaginary line on a map or whatever it may be. This is the world that we are being asked to not only, not only accept, but actively desire. We need to prove our identity with some document that is being developed by an ID2020 alliance that none of, no one even knows who they are or what they're doing or reads their white papers or particularly cares about their discussions. It'll all just be handed to you, and you should want it. This is a human right, I tell you, and the UN is going to help provide this. <sighs> anyway, I think... By this point, only the asleepest of the asleep, <laughs> the sleepiest of the sleepiest, could possibly not understand the incredible danger of stepping into this digital ID reality. So I guess at the basic, absolute, fundamental level of this, the philosophical level, which is what the solution side of things always comes back down to, I, again, any institution, governmental framework, whatever, that requires us as natural, free human beings born as sovereign individuals into this world, that the idea that we now have to access and, and register and, and have our, uh, our entire lives put on some sort of ledger or something in order to then enter, just to live our lives, just to be human beings in the world, that, that doesn't speak to a problem with the identification system that we have now and it's not good enough and we need to create a new... No, that speaks to a problem with the very concept of the institutions and the, uh, the institutional framework that we are being born into. You are not born a free human being in this world anymore. You cannot simply be a human being. You now have to register and be barcoded and scanned and put into a document and here, this is me. And now you are being, in a sense, in a key sense, reduced down to a number. And that number will then be encoded into your chip, inserted into your body, and eventually you will be the number, not the human being. And that is the fundamental problem going on here. So I think we need to address it at that level. But more practically, we are born in this system. It is here. It is not going to disappear overnight. So our role in this is to, in every way, shape, and form we can, at every point, to, as, as I think Ernest Hancock has put it before on Declare Your Independence, to be a butthead and to say no and to not provide the ID that is required of us for this or that. And the more that people actively resist and do not comply, the, well, the more we can at the very least put the, uh, the, the sticks in the wheels of this bicycle as it goes along to hopefully stop the bike from going. And more importantly, as always, we need to be building up the parallel economy that does not require digital identification in order to access this service or what have you. And that means thinking deeply and, and in a thoroughgoing manner about the reputation-based systems that will be necessary to stop all, this, all the things that will 
in undoubtedly go wrong in a situation where, oh, of course, whatever, no, no ID, no, I don't know who you are. Well, there are going to be things that will go wrong. Bad people will take advantage of those types of situations. So we need to think about reputation-based systems and how those can function. But we do not need to just leave it to daddy government. When have they ever led us astray? What could possibly go wrong with tying our national and eventually global digital ID into our ability to buy and sell? What could possibly go wrong? Anyway, if, as I say, if you're in uh, a corporate report watcher or listener, you already know the very, very dire situation that we're in. But it is important to put these issues on the table because, unfortunately, as I say, most people, most of the people around you will never have heard of an ID2020 or know about the World Economic Forum's uh, forays into digital identification or uh, into the UN and how it's trying to put this forward as some sort of human right or how this is all going to be used to tie everything together into a digital ID which will be you and that digital ID will be regulated, it'll be tracked, it'll be controlled, it will tell you where and when you can go, for how long you can go, what you can purchase when you're there, who you can and cannot interact with, and it will be regulated at the digital ID level. If they can get you and who you are as a human being into an ID, that ID can be tracked, controlled, and regulated in any way they want. And with the programmable money and other things coming in the very near future in the form of CBDCs and the vaccines that aren't vaccines that will be required to be a human in the world and all of the other uh, interventions, uh, it will all tie into digital ID. We have to understand how fundamental this is to the coming system of control and we have to not comply. Do not start putting your entire identity into the digital space because it will not lead in the direction of human freedom. And as even the World Economic Forum says in their own document on data intermediaries, it does start to raise the question of, can we retain our humanity? What does human agency mean when we are more and more digital beings? Some very, very, very important subjects. I hope you will be here to explore them with me as we step forward uh, into this coming agenda and hopefully build up the parallel economies that will get us through it. As always, the, int- the show notes for everything that I've mentioned today will be there at corbettreport.com slash digital ID, as will undoubtedly the lively discussion in the comments among Corbett Report members. If you appreciate, if you get value out of this work, I would truly appreciate you becoming a member of the Corbett Report to help support this and make this possible in the future. Details at corbettreport.com slash members. That's going to do it for today. I, uh, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. I look forward to talking to you again in the near future. At the end, what, what the fourth industrial revolution will lead to is a fusion of our physical, our digital, and our biological identities.